you've also said, I've heard you say this, that 80-20 stocks to bond portfolio is now the new 60-40, that nobody should be doing 60-40 stocks to bonds, 80-20, uh, and you can hedge protection. And can you explain why 80-20 is the new 60-40? I know you've also been talking about other kinds of things, uh, hedged equity uh, instead of bonds for diversification, um, like uh, low volatility ETFs or covered, covered calls or collared strategies. Um, what might they be able to offer as well? But just explain why 80 20 is the new 60 40. It seems you, you agree with Kevin here. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, look, we, we, we generally think Kevin's got it right. I mean, you want to be in equities as much as you can, but there are going to be constraints sometimes on how much equity you can put into a portfolio. So if you are under some of those constraints, you know, one thing you can do is you can say, listen, if 60-40 is sort of the standard portfolio, and I know I just know going in that 40% of my money is dead. Like it's gonna get, you know, like like Kevin said, you're you're talking about if you're lucky to get 3% return, probably lucky to break even this year over the next couple of years, I'm lucky to break even. And so I just want to minimize my allocation to that dead money. But I need to get the same kind of recurrent return profile, the same kind of risk characteristics as a traditional 60-40. One way to do that is to, to say, listen, we're going to cut our, our passive fixed income allocation in half, and we're going to replace uh, the equity allocation with some hedged equity uh, types of types of securities. So, you know, Kevin mentioned mentioned the OUSA. You know, those are lower volatility types of securities. You know, other there, there are other explicit sort of low vol types of types of ETFs like uh, like HUSV or, or USMV. You know, these are these are explicitly low vol uh, ETFs. There's other ways you can use derivatives uh, inside of some of these ETFs to get some of these return profiles that are a little more consistent with a, with a balanced portfolio. So something like XYLD, which is a covered call ETF, or HEQT, which uh, utilizes collars. Um, you know, these, are gonna, these are different ways to skin this risk management cat and just get us out of the box of having to invest 40% of our money in something which we know is probably not going to do very well for us and for our clients for the next three to five years. Yeah, low volatility is an interesting strategy. I, I mean, to me, it says things like, consumer staples. It says Procter & Gamble. Uh, it says utilities, for example. Uh, is there any, if Kevin is right, then we're in for a higher volatility environment. Lower volatility might make sense as a, a balance, Kevin, uh, at all. Does, does, does low vol make any sense, what he's talking about? Yeah, it does. Because remember, a lot of mandates where um, specialized ETFs like we're talking about are being used are in trust mandates or pension mandates or sovereign mandates where they mark to market every day the AUM, the assets under management. And so, the, so volatility is not their friend. They don't want huge swings in portfolios like that when an endowment fund is trying to distribute 6% a year. And so for the period in the last three years, last 36 months, volatility was extremely low and more risk assets were put on even to the most conservative mandates within sovereign or pension. Today, I think we're going to see a switch back to lower vol. I think it'll become very favorable to be in higher quality names. So as you interpret lower vol, the reason, you know, a Procter & Gamble doesn't have a 10% swing in its price in a day is it's been a steady eddy for 40 years. And so people buy their stuff and use it to live. And they, you know, just recently talked about how they've had pricing power in the first inkling of inflation here. And those are the kind of names where you can hide in the weeds. You know, for me, the low vol mandate has moved up to 40% of the holdings in our operating company. And I feel very safe being there. We've trimmed a little bit in where there's a lot of risk and volatility. Because at the end of the day, when you're marked to marking in a, in a pension or an institutional fund, it's what it's worth at 401 in the afternoon. And so you're going to see managers move towards these strategies of preservation of capital for the back end of this year. And getting 23% out of the S&P this year, I think is impossible. Be happy with eight or nine. Yeah, it's, uh, that's very interesting to mention. 8% earnings growth, 1%. That's close to the historic norm. Uh, with the dividend, the S&P has historically yielded eight to 10% a year. And yet, uh, guys, we haven't had that recently. The average, the S&P has averaged 15% a re return a year since 2009. That's rather remarkable. If you figure 10% is the typical, is the norm. It, it, if you believe in mean reversion, it would certainly argue for what Kevin is is, is saying there, um, Scott. Uh, uh, are we entering a period of maybe not negative returns, but at least subpar returns to sort of get back to that mean reversion? Eight or nine percent return would certainly make a lot of sense after fifteen percent uh, average in the last twelve or thirteen years. 
It's certainly, Bob, I mean, you, look, we could get that, but averages can be pretty misleading. Uh, you know, the, the period over which we're averaging is going to tell us a lot about uh, kind of the study that we're going to that we're going to go under. But really, you know, at, like at, at the end of the day, gains are a great risk management tool. So if we can get exposure to gains, if we can get gains in our portfolios when they're able to be gotten, um, that ends up being a pretty good risk management tool and a pretty good wealth building tool. And then when we need to play defense, let's play some defense, like Kevin said, and like like we're all thinking, look, the Fed's embarking on a tightening cycle. It's probably not going to be a 23% type of return year. Like we agree with that. Uh, but if but if we can get seven, eight, nine percent out of a you know out of a hedged equity portfolio, that's going to be pretty good and a heck of a lot better than we can do with bonds. Yeah, Kevin. Any any thoughts on allocation in, in terms of size, uh, large cap, small cap, mid cap? Everyone was piling into small cap value at the end of the year last year, and it seems to have outperformed everything else. But uh, uh, and it did all right last year, small cap value. But it's been a long, long time since since that was a market market leader here. Any thoughts on on, on size investing? Yeah, if you're going if you're going to a theme now of, of capital preservation, protecting AUM, the Russell 2000, the raw Russell 2000, which about two thirds of the names in there have no return on assets or virtually nothing, and a lot of them aren't profitable or provide distributions in the form of dividends. But there is a way to mine the Russell 2000. There's about a third of the names that do actually, uh, they're more a larger cap, they're more in the four to five billion dollar cap. You're going to find them in an index like OUSM, which mines for yield distributions and that little extra growth you're going to get in a small cap name, but avoids companies that are unprofitable or have no return on assets. So it's a more conservative, lower vol version of the S&P, or at least the Russell 2000. And the other uh, zip code that most people have avoided of late, but shouldn't because it's starting to outperform and it's at lower PE ratios, is Europe. Europe has 50 names. You'll find them in Switzerland, in the Eurozone, and in England that are household names in America, Roche and, and Nestle, names like that. They're in the 50, and you'll find that index in O-E-U-R. And at the same time, why not own those names at a slightly lower PE in most cases than their counterparts here? And there's a lot of recovery stimulus still going on in Europe, so I'm anticipating it might do as well or better than its counterparts in the, in the U.S. this year. Yeah. So district, I, I do 40% in, um, in, you know, in something like OUSA, uh, and 30% uh, in, in Europe, and, and the rest in small cap. And I, I think that might do very, very well in OUSM. It's boring, but yeah. these days I like boring. <laughs> boring is good. You're right. Well, there's a mean reversion trade. Your, Europe, uh, uh, Scott, uh, Europe has uh, underperformed the United States for years now. Uh, Small cap has underperformed big cap. Kevin seems to be talking about a mean reversion trade. Uh, look, we, we like mean reversions trade in general. Uh, this one might be a little bit more challenging for us, though. It's quite simply, Europe and small caps are geared towards uh, expanding economies. You know, when, when, when the economy is expanding, when it's growing, uh, and when that rate of change is growing, those types of securities tend to do fairly well, uh, especially Europe. Uh, right now, like we think we're probably entering a phase where, where growth is going to be slowing globally. You know, not only do we have an EM tightening cycle that's, that's already a year old, uh, we have China not really stepping on the gas in terms of policy. We've got the Fed and other developed markets starting to tighten policy. Uh, so, you know, overall, we think it's going to be an okay year. I mean, you know, look, consumers and the, and the corporations are flush. Uh, so they're pretty good. Like, we're not, we're not really worried about a recession in the United States by any stretch of the imagination. But we think it's probably going to be a slower growth year. And slower growth years tend to be a little bit more challenging for things like Europe and small caps.